Hello, this is John Spink. I'm the director and assistant professor of the Food Fraud Initiative at Michigan State University. And this is our Food Fraud Initiative video encyclopedia. Chapter 16 covers articles, they're overviews of articles, and this is module 2 covering our article Introducing the Food Fraud Initial Screening Model, FFIS. First off, this is based on a journal article that was published in 2016 in Food Control with uh, co-authors Dr. Doug Moyer from the Program in Public Health and the Food Fraud Initiative here at Michigan State University and Dr. Sherry Spire Perro, who's in the Business School at Michigan State University. Overall in the highlights are food fraud's illegal deception for economic gain using food. We focus on the broad definition. Food fraud laws, regulations, standards, and certifications are under development now, so this type of research is helpful. A novel food fraud risk assessment is proposed and referred to here as an initial screening, also sometimes uh, referred to as a pre-filter. Uh, this assessment is based on enterprise risk management principles. We focus on them and reference them throughout. The, the assessment correlates with other food fraud and food safety management systems that could be more detailed food fraud vulnerability assessments, or other types of food safety uh, management systems or uh, hazard assessments. First off, to step back, um, this initial screening is a key component of the Food Fraud Protection Plan, an overall plan, which is based on enterprise risk management principles. This ties everything into one system uh, where the corporation can make resource allocation decision making. And uh, we cite COSO, um, and COSO um, organization has uh, enterprise risk management um, definitions, training, regulations, um, um, reports, and what they do is, is for um, for enterprise risk management, it's broken into two stages. And the first is a qualitative initial screening, and then followed later by a more detailed quantitative assessment. This is from COSO principles. And so what it does here is there's a, a first pass through to review, kind of scope the lay of the land, and then go into more details where it's necessary, specifically for resource allocation decision making. In some cases, this qualitative assessment may be enough for compliance or, or that, that decision making. Um, and this actually has been defined as one of the key points already in the initial assessment area covered by the S-SAFE um, vulnerability assessment that's implemented by PwC. And the S-SAFE um, activities have been endorsed by the Global Food Safety uh, Initiative. And the terminal point on their flowchart is complete as a minimum a FFVA on a company-wide basis. So this initial screening at the very most basic uh, level is that type of um, company-wide basis. And then uh, that second stage, as I mentioned, uh, of the initial screening is the more detailed food fraud vulnerability assessment. While the desired outcome for risk mitigation planning is detailed vulnerability assessments, broader initial screening can make the process much more manageable. Often a detailed by individual product assessment is not practical due to the nature of the risk, the time allotted, or the detail needed for resource allocation and decision making. This statement from our article was based on risk science and other risk literature. And the key here is giving the um, authority or the ability, the opportunity, that the um, support for doing this high level assessment first to look holistically at the entire company. You don't want to just go into detail for one type of fraud or one type of product. You want to take a look across the entire corporation and then go into more detail where needed. And, and basically, there may be some areas that you don't need to go into any more detail. You have enough um, information at that high level. Or a countermeasure may address an entire product group globally. So um, that's where there's an efficiency of starting here at this initial screening step. Second, to look at where the initial screening and the vulnerability assessments and COSO and decision making all fit together, here's a hierarchy. On the left, the corporate risk appetite. This is the real key to everything. This is how much risk the business and the investors in the business are willing to take. This is not a decision made at the operational level. This is not even a decision made by, by the president or the chief executive officer. This is made at the chairman of the board and the board, since the board of directors represents the people who have invested in the business. And under that corporate risk appetite, it's managed through enterprise risk management. And this is across the entire corporation. For food fraud, there's two steps here, as we pointed earlier, for enterprise risk management. One is the initial screening, and the second is the more detailed vulnerability assessment. On that more, under the more detailed assessment, there are other um, activities or processes or products uh, already uh, developed. And one is for adulterant substances for the vulnerability assessment. U.S. Pharmacopeia has a specific type of vulnerability assessment, which would help inform or feed into the overall food fraud vulnerability assessment. Also, to 
holistically meet the GFSI requirements, which also are requirements for laws around the world, such as the Food Safety Modernization Act. You must re review all types of fraud incidents that could lead to a health hazard. That could be stolen goods that are left out to spoil and uh, some type of, of hazard occurs. So the, the root cause would be the stolen goods. Um, the, the fraudsters would not be putting the uh, uh, hazardous ingredient in at that point. So the steps for food safety uh, in initial screening. First, define the scope in most basic terms. Incident review to start gathering information so you know what type of assessment uh, you'll be conducting. Conduct a food fraud initial screening for health hazards and separately for financial impact. A key is that Food Safety Modernization Act specifically requires the, the um, um, vulnerability assessment for health hazards, but a corporation is a financial entity and must conduct a financial impact, and the decision making will be based on financial impact. So this we have here is step 3 and step 3B. 3A and 3B. Dex then put those risks on a corporate risk rank. At the start, this will be very difficult because it has never been done before. But these really need to get onto that corporate risk rank so a resource allocation decision maker can make a decision. Someone like a chief financial officer or chief risk officer that can really analyze and define whether a vulnerability is acceptable or not. So to start working on the initial screening, you have the overall concept, and it's broken down into ingredients and finished goods. We found from a lot of our research that to combine the two really gets to be very challenging, cumbersome, and really not helpful when you're looking at specifically vulnerable, vulnerable vulnerability assessments between the two. So when we split that out, we do look at the hazards and the economic threats. We do that for both areas. And then those hazards go into one type of final assessment combined again, and that would be for the Food Safety Modernization Act, or GFSI. And the economic would go into that enterprise-wide corporate uh, risk, risk assessment. So defining the basic terms, we do split to ingredients and finished products. And these two types of products are so different that a separate assessment should be performed for each. We have that quoted in our article, so people can use that and reference it. Define the risk rank terminology, including very high, high, medium, low, and very low. We find that five is a good number. That's actually supported in the literature to say that that that's that's. Then you can differentiate more between that kind of medium and high. You've you've got you've got a range there. So five has been what's been uh, recommended uh, again in the literature, ISO, and other other areas. Presenting numerical results could imply precision that is unjustified. This is a real key. And this is again uh, based in the literature and covered more, in more detail in the article. But there's a there's a big emphasis on words versus numbers, because even if it's three versus four, medium versus high, then there's a a um, uh, you, you're implying precision. Even worse would be if it was 2.5 versus 2.7, where if the input is very qualitative, you would be showing two significant digits, 2.7. 2.5 and you'd be implying that there was precision in those numbers when it really be may be just more of, a, of an average of, of, of the, again that qualitative judgment. Determ, ter, determine up to five regions or markets and up to five product groups. We find that that five by five matrix is is pretty good. One thing is, is that that matrix needs to cover the entire corporation. There may be a other category for regions and an other category for products but it really needs to cover the entire company. And there's no hard and fast rules about more, but, but every time you add more um, regions or product groups, just the assessment gets more complex and takes more time. Step two is the incident review. In this step, incidents or suspicious activity is reviewed, and there are many acceptable sources for the information, including subject matter in expert insight. This is a real key, and again, why we quote it in the article, so that you have this as a, as a reference. Um, subject matter expert opinion is very valid in risk management, especially, again, supported by the literature, especially when this is a new risk or it's the first time through analyzing it. And also with the experts, you have um, you do have a potential for some bias, but you also have uh, the, um, you, you can gain the insight from their expertise as well. And it's real key to just identify that you're using subject matter expert insight. This is a very uh, efficient starting point that can quickly identify whether there's a lack of information or where the enterprise decision makers need more data. The bottom line, the bottom line, the bottom line is the resource allocation decision makers. For them to look at this and assess whether they uh, support 
uh, mitigating this risk or not, whether it's acceptable. And uh, there's a lot of factors in there, including the health hazard. But the bottom line is whether that resource allocation decision maker has enough data to make the, make the decision. And so you want to run through this quickly to identify where they do need more or not. You don't want to, do, you don't want to give them more detail than, than they need. The results in screening or filtering out those risks that the enterprise deems as lower priority and leads to the second step where the remaining high risk priorities are addressed quantitatively. Here again, if there's one area, one region, one product that's that's of great concern or has a very high vulnerability, then this would identify that that's one of the areas to prioritize first. So you don't start through this with every single product. This is a process and a method to identify which ones you work on first. So step three is conduct the food fraud initial screening for health hazards and economic impact. The first is the health hazards. For regulatory compliance, such as for the U.S. Food Safety Modernization Act, it's important to conduct a separate risk assessment for health hazards. Although FDA has not provided specific advice yet, this step addresses known or reasonably foreseeable hazards using, using the uh, FSMA preventive controls hazard definition of an illness or a death. So this is what we're looking at in this first review of the hazards. GFSI technically only considers hazards as, as well, but again, the enterprise risk management systems or the, the uh, corporations themselves uh, that are using it would need to um, assess this in terms of financial. Corporate requirements extend to all financial risks. Initial screening matrix. An initial screening should be as broad as it is indicative only of which enterprise fraud risks may need to be more fully assessed. Again, here it is in a quote clearly. So go only as, as broad or as deep as you need to go um, to identify where you need to do uh, more assessment. And there are four matrices that we'd work with. Uh, ingredients and finished goods, of course, are the two main areas, but each of them has a hazard and an economic uh, matrix. And this is what the matrix looks like. Any matrix could do, but this, for the sake of uh, our article, we, we created this one. It's a five by five matrix. You'll notice here we have Europe and spices as a very high. This will come into play later when I show where it falls on the uh, corporate risk map. Financial impact. This, this step is the same as, as step 3A above, but the focus is on all enterprise risks with respect to financial impact. We did step 3A for hazards only. Step 3B is for financial impact. There's not necessarily a direct correlation between health hazards or economic impacts, though usually the economic impact of a health hazard is among the highest costs. So once we look at hazards, something like an illness that would have a recall, have, have costs associated with the illness, have a legal liability lawsuits based on that illness, those would usually be the highest uh, among the highest costs. But of course, recall and other, other issues are there as well. Lacking direct input from the enterprise's financial decision makers, the risk assessment team, which could be the food safety team, may make temporary educated guesses regarding the risk rankings. So the CFO is not involved in the process at the start. So we as the, the food safety team will review this, conduct the initial screening, and then estimate where we think this fits on the corporate risk map. This is a great starting point. And then this, this allows the enterprise risk management team, the chief risk officer or CFO, to manage by exception and tell us where they believe that our assessments have not been correlated with their, their estimates of risk. The corporate risk rank. So the ingredient and finished product issues are plotted and this is correlated with all corporate risks. So this map is not only food risks, and regardless of if the vulnerability assessment for food fraud says it's a high, medium, or low, we're plotting this on your corporate risks. Uh, the assessment is calibrated with the resource allocation decision maker. Any adjustments will be rolled down into the previous assessments, meaning that if we define this item 3B as, as you know, uh, medium very high on the, the likelihood and severity, but the CFO says it's really medium low, then once we get that input on this final matrix, we can then go back and adjust our original risk ranks, and so the system can be self-correcting. And here's what the corporate-wide enterprise risk management uh, chart looks like. Um, and you'll notice here that I mentioned item 3B. Uh, that would correlate down here on this medium very high. Um, previously, I mentioned that spices um, worldwide was a very high, very high. Here's item A1 on there. This is now something we can discuss with that resource allocation decision maker, explaining why these are in this, the, the red or orange, and why these are close, and why these are low. 
Um, with Michigan State University, we have a number of ways that you can engage us, all the way from graduate courses that are in our Masters of Science and Food Safety program. We do executive education on campus and, and around the world. We conduct multi-client studies. And we have a massive open online course that's offered twice a year, mid-May and mid-November. Please contact us if you need any more information. Also, I'd like to take a moment to thank many people for the support of this program. Thank you. Have a great day.